All right, we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the next session. So throughout the day today, we have a, a series of short talks by, um, by current uh, PIs for SATSI. And um, I've asked them to talk a little bit about their actual work, but, um, but also uh, about the process and um, any insights that they can offer on that side. Uh, so uh, the first of these speakers is uh, Marina Blanton, who's a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Notre Dame. And she'll be talking uh, about her, her work and her experience uh, with that work and the funding process and the research process on secure computation and outsourcing. Thank you, Marina. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that when this workshop was offered the first time two years ago, I told the program officers that I thought it was such a great idea and I wish that was available earlier. At the time, I already had my NSF funding, so I didn't attend the workshop, but I decided to go look, uh, watch the videos anyway. So as I was watching a video of a distinguished researcher talking about the difficulty of managing a, a very large grant, uh, that it had a lot of people, I was thinking that that's not it. This is not what these people want. They need to hear from somebody like me, a relatively junior person who actually can speak about the failures that preceded success. And incidentally, two years later, I'm here speaking in front of this audience. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would like to make this talk as uh, useful to you as I, as I can. Uh, and so I would like to speak primarily about my experience with the NSF proposals and grants. But as a part of it, I still would like to talk about my area and the projects that I have so that you get the context for, uh, for my work and my projects. Okay. So the general area of my work, uh, this is something I spend most of my time now, is in the so-called research direction of secure computation and outsourcing. And so the idea is that we have multiple parties that have their private, in, private data, and they would like somehow uh, you know, engage in this collaborative computation where they submit their private data, but they don't give it away to each other. They basically evaluate some function on their data and learn the result, but nothing else is revealed about their data other than just the output that they learn. Okay? So the idea here is the computation or the security guarantees are the same, as if we had this trusted third party where we all submit our data, get the result back, and so it's clear that in that setting we're not gonna learn anything else other than the result. So we try to simulate uh, the, basically, the same setting through some crypt cryptographic uh, techniques. And so th this work started many years ago, and by now we know that any uh, function can be secure, evaluated in this framework, but in the recent years, we try to actually bring this closer to practice. We try to optimize, and there's multiple directions where you can optimize either the general techniques or you can optimize some building blocks that are commonly used in computation, for example, integer comparisons that's used in so many different functions. Or you can even build some custom protocols for very specific functions uh, where you can exploit the structure of the computation to make it more efficient. Uh, and the second component here is uh, secure computation outsourcing, which is somewhat related to the previous one. And the idea here is that we can have computational limited clients that don't have uh, resources to maintain their own infrastructure. And I would like to use cloud computing to outsource their computation but there's uh, serious security and privacy considerations that come in place, and in particular is that if my data is sensitive, proprietary, uh, classified, then I'm just not gonna uh, give it away to some third party. So I wanna make sure that uh, the data is protected when it's used in the computation. And the second component is that uh, I don't, I, I, as a client, I don't have control over uh, this third party cloud provider, so the computation may be corrupt, may be skipped, the result that I get back may be wrong, and I have no means of telling what exactly happened. Right? So in some way, the secure computation outsourcing uh, area deals with these two aspects. 
So the first one is that before we submit computation to the cloud, we'll somehow protect the data and the computation takes form on the protected data so that the servers learn no information at all about the data that we placed with them. And the second component is verification of the result, verification of the integrity of the function that was executed, that the function was executed on the correct data so that we can trust the result. And clearly, you, you want this verification to be fast so that you don't have to redo the task yourself to know whether the answer is correct or not. Okay, so this is just a general scope. So within this general area, I have, I currently have two projects that are funded by this program. Both of them are single PI projects, so that they're relatively small in the scope, they fund a couple of students for three years. Uh, and if you're new, you'll likely wanna start with a small project as a PI before moving to uh, bigger projects um, that uh, involve more people and uh, sort of more uh, management. So the first project deals specifically with biometric data and how we can securely uh, process this data in environments that are not full, fully trusted. So this covers a variety of different settings when we have two parties, when we have more, when we have outsourcing. It also includes this integrity a verification component where with the computation on the result comes back, I wanna make sure that that's actually correct. Uh, and it specifically optimizes computation for the special purpose algorithms that use in biometric processing, special data representations, and deals with a lot of different biometric modalities, such as iris fingerprint, uh, voice data, DNA, that are all very diverse in terms of the algorithms and underlying uh, algorithms that they use for, for their comparison. So uh, the first time I submitted a proposal for this project, it was in somewhat different form. So it included two components. The first one was, the first component was basically this part, the, this project and, and the current form. And it dealt with uh, using secure techniques to aid uh, processing of biometric data. We want to use secure computation techniques to protect biometric data once, once being used in environments that are not fully trusted. And the second component was the opposite. Basically, we wanna use biometric data to aid security techniques. For example, if we have some anonymous tokens that we can use for authentication, those are prone to abuse. But if we tie them to biometric data, then basically every time you you're, can use these anonymous tokens, you have to provide the correct biometric so that the abuse is gonna be limited. Okay, so I had this project and I was excited about the idea, but when I got uh, the proposal back, so it, it was clear that the first two parts were not equal. One was substantially bigger than the other, and the reviewer saying, oh, there is not as tightly integrated as they could be. And so, I mean, I tried to, you know, improve the, this proposal, and I did not necessarily, I mean, I could not necessarily make them equal in their scope, and I could not provide a tighter integration. So I decided to just completely drop the second part, and this is actually in the form that this project was later funded. Uh, the second project that I have uh, deals with this general purpose computation. Uh, so the idea, the, the idea that I had is that what if we take a general purpose program, right, that, that can actually uh, handle sensitive data, but we wanna take this and transform into something that's suitable for uh, outsourcing uh, and where we actually can probably protect all of the data that's being handled in this environment that's not fully trusted. And so there's a lot of techniques that have been developed over time, but many of them are special purpose. They say optimize integer arithmetic. But integer computation is not what a general purpose uh, program has, so I wanted to include additional components. Right, so the, the first one that I say, I want to provide uh, secure arithmetic for working with standard data types. You know, floating point arithmetic, strengths, any data type that you can declare in a C program, right? The second component is uh, data oblivious algorithms and data structures uh, that, as they're used in outsourced computation. And data oblivious execution is defined as having exactly the same sequences of steps instructions that are being executed, and memory locations that are being accessed are independent of the data, 
Okay? So in this way, it's guaranteed that when we execute this algorithm, we use this data structure, if everything that we access is, de is independent of the data, there is no information can be revealed about the data. And this is in particular important for uh, se secure outsourcing where the machines who do the computation are not allowed to learn anything at all about the data that they are processing. And so then the third component includes a compiler that basically takes a C program. It's actually not a C program, but a program that's written an extension of C, where if we have the, the data that's supposed to be private, that's supposed to be protected, you just mark the variable as private. Okay, and we take this program, we compile into another program that's actually C, uh, also a C program, and then, uh, but that C program can be scheduled to run on a cloud provider, and it probably protects every time we use this private data. So it builds, it links this secure arithmetic uh, to the data in the places that, where it's necessary. The public data is not modified, it's just arithmetic with private data is being transformed into secure distributed computation, okay? So uh, the first time I submitted this project, this, this proposal, it was not funded. And, uh, and basically, I took the reviewer's feedback. Uh, I, I was very excited about this idea, and it's probably difficult to convey my excitement in, in the short period of time that I'm given here, uh, but the, what the reviewers thought is that the compiler part was interesting and was underdefined. So I worked more uh, on this project, I developed new results, I included them in the proposal, I expanded more on the compiler part, and that the project was uh, funded the second time I submitted. And so when I say that you know, I address the reviewers' comments, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that this is a recipe for success. I know of so many different cases when you, you, somebody gets proposal back, addresses the reviewers' comments, resubmits, and gets worse rating than before, okay? So you need to use your best judgment in revising the proposal. This is your work, you know it's best, and so think what's the best uh, you know, in terms of this work. And maybe you can uh, include better results that are more compelling, that they're gonna excite the reviewer more, uh, as opposed to just revising according to the comments. And, and this is even more so important for multidisciplinary projects where we have uh, different components, so th where the expertise of the re reviewer can vary greatly. So you got one reviewer, you address their comments, then you got a reviewer with completely different background, you don't know what they, they're gonna want from you, right? Uh, so I suggest that you use your best judgment in revising proposals. And so uh, what I'd like to talk about next, and in some way my experience, things that work for me, things that didn't work for me. And the, first, and the first thing that I want to mention is that as a new faculty, uh, you know, as a new PhD, you probably don't have a lot of experience with um, you know, proposal writing, and most of what I saw was uh, proposals that my PhD advisor wrote, right? But the writing style of that proposal is actually some, something I tried to mimic and something didn't work for me very well, okay? Uh, and the, the way I perceived it, that may be not the way he did it, but the way I perceived it is that you describe your idea, you talk about you know, different components of the project, and you describe preliminary work as, uh, as one particular result uh, uh, with enough detail. Uh, what I had better luck with, if you, ha if you actually include multiple prior results for different components of the project where you don't necessarily describe them in a lot of details. The reviewers actually don't want to review your search paper given this high level idea, but if you have multiple results, you have basically more options. You choose those that are most interesting, most significant, and you put them forward in, in your proposal. So this ties to the second point that I have on the slide. And another thing that was helpful to me is that as before I would resubmit a revision, I continued working on this project, and so I had uh, new ideas that I can include in it and some my better results, and that strengthens uh, my proposals uh, the, you know, the next time I submit it, okay? And so if you ask me, you know, what does it take to go from uh, a, a proposal 
to a grant, right? How can we get a, a, you know, a proposal funded? So I would suggest that, that there's um, you know, several uh, important points that you wanna make sure are present in, uh, in your proposal. And so SATC is a very competitive program. The uh, you know, very experienced people submitted, people from the best universities submitted, uh, but it also doesn't mean that they're successful in the first time either. So, I mean, uh, everybody has a rejected proposal. Uh, and so, you know, you, you need to put your best effort forward to make sure that you get the best, right propo the best proposal that you could. And so the first thing that I mentioned here is you need to have an interesting, an interesting research idea. And uh, in some way, this is understood. But what you want to make sure is you want to be excited about this idea and you want to convey your excitement through the proposal as well. So when somebody reads this, it's like, oh, yeah, that, that, that sounds interesting. Uh, and, but the idea itself clearly is not everything. You need to provide uh, a description of what you want to do with this idea, where you want to take it. Right? Uh, and so often this will be either describe how you want to do it or include some preliminary results, but the results need to be interesting, right? Uh, I would say uh, at least one paper or publishable result doesn't have to be a paper, it could be a technical report, but something that's interesting, something that contributes uh, to your field. And uh, I suggest that if you have an option, choose the best thing that you can include. Right, as say, uh, as a, a proposal reviewer, if somebody gets um, a neat idea that happens early in the proposal, it might wow them until the end of the proposal and they'll be excited, right? Everybody puts their best work forward and you should also, okay? Uh, the next thing that, that I mentioned in here is solid integration of project components, which in some way is uh, as important. Uh, when I served on NSF panels, I, sometimes you see these proposals where people th put three parts together that are not really, that are not really go together well, and, and you know that the project is not gonna go anywhere, right? Uh, and so if you have a project where you include multiple components and one of them is not necessarily tightly integrated with the rest, I suggest that you think about restructuring. Uh, there are so many that read beautifully as one story, and you want to have this coherent story of uh, why your project is great. And the project scope can matter more for uh, proposals such as career, where if it's too small, too large, it will likely not be funded. But for general programs, you can always adjust uh, the scope of the project, you can reduce the budget, and so you just make sure that the budget reflects the scope of the project. Uh, the next point, uh, which I call persistence, is very important, right? Uh, so you get a proposal that didn't get funded, you gather feedback, try again. I mean, I think that, you know, many people have very exciting ideas. Uh, people can write good proposals that get positive reviews where the reviewers suggest uh, resubmission, but it's not funded. And in some way, ta you know, taking this last, last leap from good not funded to very good funded is the most difficult step, right? And you should just, you know, try again, resubmit, improve, uh, you know, the, the proposal in the way you can and just try again. Okay. And the last uh, point here that's in some ways very important is using help, right? Ask your colleagues to read a draft of your uh, proposal, get feedback. Uh, serving on NSF panels is, uh, you know, available for, for a lot of people. It certainly helped me. It just provides a different perspective. Uh, the first time I served on NSF panel was relatively late. And this is because since I started my position, I was submitting to uh, proposals to this program, SATSI, or its predecessors. And so even if somebody asked me, do you want to serve in the panel, I'll say, no, I you know, have a conflict of interest. So what I ended up doing is I talked to the uh, program uh, officer uh, who distributed my CV across other programs. And actually, the first panel on which I served was not for this program, was for a different program, but it also had security proposals submitted to it. 
okay? Uh, and clearly you can talk to the program officers uh, with any questions. I personally wouldn't talk to a program officer, uh, you know, wouldn't ask a question for the sake of asking a question, but there was, but there was this one time when talking to them actually provided critical information to me. Uh, once I got a proposal that was not funded and the reviews just didn't make sense to me. And you know, I went to talk to the program officer who oversaw the panel and he provided me with critical information that actually was not uh, included in the reviews and, I, and that informed me how to proceed with that proposal that was actually funded the next time I tried. Okay, so I'd like to stop here and if we have time for questions, I'll take your questions. Right. I mean, so this might be a general question. I mean, she, she made two good examples where resubmission was done, right? If when you resubmit, do you have to say this is a resubmission of this and these are how I have taken care of the prior, prior reviews because the reviews will be very different and they will have totally different uh, view of the whole thing. So what is the right thing to do? S indicate that beforehand that these are the issues that we have taken care of? I mean, normally there are all separate submissions. There is no history associated with the, with the proposal. So it will be looked as a new submission without prior history. Okay. So you'll get just new issues, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I said, there is no guarantee that uh, somebody is going to like your proposal next time, especially if you get completely different set of reviewers. And so I said for multidisciplinary, this is special of an issue. So you made a good point about um, having some published results or preliminary results. So the problem is I, I fail to understand how pre preliminary it should be. So you don't want to at the same time give a feeling that um, the problem is solved, but at the same time in some sense. So uh, yeah, so do, do, do you have more ideas on? Well, I mean, I would say that depends on the scope of your project. Right? If you have one result, you have three results, it still can be preliminary. If you say, that, look, there are so many other things that need to be addressed within the scope of this project. And some projects clearly can be very large, so even if you have 10 publications, this is comparing to the scope of the project that, that's not going to be a large fraction of it. So I mean, I would say it all depends on the project and what you're proposing, so you want to propose uh, significantly more beyond the work that already is available. All right, thank you.